You're listening to the Veterinary Innovation Podcast. You're listening to the Veterinary Innovation Podcast. My name is Sean Wilkie. Along with my awesome co-host, we interview the innovators in this space every week. Ivan, please go ahead and introduce today's guest. Hi, I'm Ivan Zek. Very excited to introduce you all to Liz Whitaker. Uh, Liz is the founder and CEO of Paulytics software that aggregates and consolidates pet data to create electronic health records for pets so pet professionals can adopt, care for, and treat any animal at any time. She's a serial entrepreneur and subject matter expert with two decades of her life dedicated to the pet space. Foremost, Liz is dedicated to creating profits through purpose with a focus on helping to save the true love homeless pets. Welcome to the show, Liz. Thank you so much for having me. I'm very excited to be here. So tell us all about it. Politics. So you are aggregating the clinical data. Is that correct? Yeah. So what's really cool about politics is is how we started and where that led us into building electronic health records. So my entire background comes from working in the nonprofit space, working with uh, foster-based animal rescues, as well as the brick and mortar animal shelters. And through that experience, found that they really didn't have a lot of great options for software and technology or anything to streamline their processes. So throughout my tenure working, you know, boots on the ground in animal rescue, decided I really didn't want to be the one driving paperwork around to my other teammates that were running the rescue. And so that is really where politics came into the picture. And I started the company in an effort to make running an animal rescue easier, streamlined, more efficient. As we were putting politics together and released it to the public and to our customers, we started noticing that every single pet record had a microchip number associated with it. And we wanted to challenge ourselves to think of ways that we could help animals that potentially weren't going to be going through the animal sheltering system, but also to help animals as they exited the animal sheltering system and were adopted. And so we decided that utilizing the microchip numbers to create this one true digitized record of a pet could be utilized then when that pet goes on outside of the shelter system to see veterinarians, to see boarding kennels, groomers, trainers, et cetera, uh, so that every professional working in that pet's life could have the most uh, up-to-date information and context to work with that pet. It's so fascinating. Uh, I've been through sort of animal data for a while yeah. since the smart flow days, integrating stuff, then trying yeah. to sort of be on the other side at IDX. And now again on, well, this is now on a third side. So now I'm more in sort of a group management. The problem that everybody has, and you know it, um, right. is that it's not unified and getting <laughs> no. into a flat uh, Avimark file is a lot of fun. How do you do that? Do you extract data yourself? Do you use others and then you normalize? How do you read into flat files? And yeah. what can you tell us about it? Yeah, no, it's a really great, great question. And that's something that we've worked very, very hard on over the last couple of years is really to become experts at what the under the hood pet data looks like for all these various software systems and, and even pet consumer systems that are in place. And what we found is that you're right, nothing is, is normalized, nothing is unified, you know, everything is different in every single system. And so we kind of examined where we could fit into the market and provide the most value. And what we found was that, you know, there's so many software systems available for veterinarians, for groomers, for trainers, for even, even animal shelters themselves, that we thought the value is not really in recreating the wheel and in, in creating better software per se, although that is part of our roadmap, uh, we saw the value in being the ecosystem that we aggregate the data from all the other players, normalize it based on what we have determined to be a standard for pet data, and then be able to uh, transfer that information back to the various players that are working within our ecosystem. So, you know, if one vet clinic is using software option A and another vet clinic is using software option B, that data can get aggregated into the politics database. We normalize it to one unified system that we've, we've determined, and then we're able to spit that information back within the context of whichever software uh, program that you're utilizing. And this is true for, you know, vet software options. This is also true for consumer plays, telemedicine plays, uh, really anything along those lines. So how far are you into actually decoding all of that stuff? Because this is, you know, this is this is very, very compelling offer. And do you work with individual? Well, I, I guess this is not for individual hospitals. It's more like for either groups 
Right. Or so who is your target customer and who should be jumping up and down being like, finally, I heard about this company. <laughs> yeah, no, that's a great question. So today who our current customer is, is the foster based animal rescues and brick and mortar animal shelters. Why we're starting there is that we're giving them a software program where they can manage their operations more efficiently, streamline a lot of the mundane data related tasks that are happening in an animal rescue and animal shelter. Why we're starting there is that we found that every single shelter and rescue is microchipping pets before they leave that ecosystem. So it's very important to us to get that unique identifier, very similar to how you know Carfax utilizes uh, VIN numbers of cars, how the IRS uses EIN numbers, uh, how in health we can use social security numbers for people as well. So we're taking that unique identifier that we're able to capture at the animal shelter and animal rescue level and be able to use that as we build more players into our ecosystem. So, you know, some good examples of partners are Mela, which was a, you know, a previous guest on this, this show. Um, we're working with various microchipping companies and then some other uh, pet consumer play companies that we you know, can't exactly mention yet. Uh, but as we build more into these ecosystems, we're having more of this aggregation of data that we're normalizing into what we've determined as a good standard based on what we've looked at over you know, uh, different software options and researching a lot of what scientists in the space have determined to be normal when they're doing performing their research as well. That's great, Liz, and admirable and something that me and Ivan have spoken about a ton. How did you, or who is we, yeah. figure out what to normalize the data as? Uh, and that sounds like almost an impossible task. Yeah, I mean, it's it's not easy because everybody, even when you're talking to the biggest associations in the animal health space, everybody is determined, you know, their own source of normal. And so what we did, or what I did rather, is I sat down and I pulled together all the various, uh, depending on the species that I was looking at, or depending on, you know, if we're looking at medical records, for example, then we're going to be looking at different uh, thought leaders in the space as setting the lead and setting the example. So then I pull in all the research from these various thought leaders, depending on the section of data that I'm working on normally normalizing, and basically create a matrix to understand what are the commonalities between the various players, what are the abnormalities, what are things that are considered outliers that are not going to be as useful for the rest of the players, and then creating a standard based on all of that information, giving certain weights to specific thought leaders as well. Uh, and then when we build that out, presenting that to the community, and and we've wor we're working right now on creating um, open source documentation to allow other players in the space to be able to map data to each other more seamlessly as well. Even in the animal sheltering space, this is a problem simply to map data from a shelter software such as our own to you know a pet adoption website such as you know Adopt a Pet or Pet Finder. Even the simplicity between that is not actually simple at all. Very interesting. You're talking about the um, so unique identifier. Uh, mm -hmm. It was and is one of the major major problems. You know, at IDEX, the same pet in three different softwares would have different ID internally. And I think that you know, microchip is an interesting way of of centralizing it. But there's there is microchip companies, and there's some animals without the microchip. Mm -hmm. So it really reminds me of this you know favorite joke about the. 10 developers, you know, got together to, to kind of change because there was 10 languages, 10 <laughs> different coding languages, and they wanted to bring a solution and they built an 11th language. So are you creating additional or how do you reconcile in those that don't have microchip and yeah. how do you reconcile between the companies that different companies, or you just take that particular pet's microchip that is there and is that how it is? Yeah, yeah, I know. That's a great question. So we focus heavily on the microchip ID to start because when you're talking about being able to build out machine learning algorithms in the future that can identify which pet is which, we need to have some sort of baseline to understand what are signals that can allow us to understand which pet is which without a microchip number. And so to start this kind of program, you have to have some sort of unique identifier to be able to start picking up on patterns that are going to emerge that tell us that, you know, pet A over in this vet software within the same city is going to be the same pet over here at veterinary clinic B that's using an entirely different software, right? So we have to be able to come up with some sort of baseline uh, to understand what that context can look like in the future in terms of being able to identify pets that don't have a microchip number. So when we're talking about early days, Paulytics and creating this normalized and central database, 
all we have to go off of in the beginning is the microchip number. And it's something that can be consistently unique, regardless of the manufacturer or even down to the country that these pets are coming from or being uh, having their microchips implanted in. So, Liz, one of the things that like is top of mind for me is, you know, what's the importance of this type of data in animal shelters, because that's where you're starting. And then kind of as a second part of the question, what do you think it does for the future of kind of like pet health? Yeah, no, I, and that, that's something that gets me really excited to talk about because, you know, my personal mission in, in this world is to be able to work with homeless pets and pets that are coming from an animal shelter environment. And that's just an area that I've always been very passionate about and, and that it really is the foundational story of Paul Lytics. We've always been an impact focused company. So when we're talking about data within the animal sheltering environment, we're really trying to understand, can we provide one, context and an understanding to what is happening in animal sheltering and, and look at data, how we can potentially go attain more adopters, more fosters, more volunteers and more donors and what the patterns are from the human context, but also then looking at the patterns from the animal perspective. Are there ways that we can keep pets out of the shelter environment and with their families so that we're not inundating and burdening the animal shelter system? Uh, and so there's a lot of ways that we can look at the data within politics and, and various shelter software systems to help provide more feedback and tools to the animal shelters themselves. So that's the part that's doing good and very impact driven for our company. When we're talking about what this data can do at large for the animal health community, the sky, as big as you can dream it, is really what we can utilize all this animal health data for. If we can truly capture, you know, say, lifelong data of what's happening to these animals, then think about from a pharmaceutical perspective, from an insurance perspective, from even basic care providing perspective, how we can assist more animals in the future through the impact, through leveraging this kind of data of being able to understand patterns that are going to emerge from, you know, the adopters that are providing information on these pets, from the practitioners who get to add data to these files and then be able to extract that data later on to understand it. So when we're looking at animal health pet data, we all understand that it is very fragmented as is. And if we continue to do what we've always done, we're going to get what we've always gotten. And so by being able to centralize and normalize this data and get longer patterns of data and context to these pets, we can utilize that in various innovation settings, whether that is for animal health, nutrition, behavior, uh, so on and so forth. We can really push the entire industry forward with this amount of clean and organized data. So you start in the shelters. Where do you go next? What happens with the evolution of yeah. what you guys are trying to do? Yeah, absolutely. So for us, we're working on building out an adopters portal because adopters are going to be the ones that are really steering what's kind of next for their pet, whether they are going to the vet clinic, whether they are picking up uh, new products and subscriptions for their pet. You know, that could be uh, telemedicine, emergency funds that they're signing up for. That could be smart doggy collars or smart cat collars that they're signing up for. So we're opening up an adopters portal for the adopter to be able to really claim and own their pet's records and data. From there, we're working on building out a lot of partnerships with other pet consumer and pet medical organizations. So we have lots of partnerships with various microchip companies we're building up, partnerships with medical device companies that they're going to be seeing you know, when their pet goes to the vet, as well as partnerships with other software companies that are more geared towards you know, consumers and pet owners as well. So as we're building up these partnerships, it's allowing us to aggregate more and more of that data into one central ecosystem that then can be given to the pet owner to have this one central place to own what is happening with their pet records, be able to have context and be able to pass that context on to the next pet care provider that's going to be working with their pet. You have an interesting pricing model. I was just looking at the website and it's, mm -hmm. uh, you know, I haven't seen, um, I think we thought about this at some point sort of per record per something. So can you tell us more how you, what is it? Uh, yeah. and, uh, and how did you arrive to that and whether <laughs> yeah. it was already tested or not? <laughs> and and uh, how do you think it's going to support the development? Yeah, absolutely. So we were very intentional and strategic about our price model. We charge our animal rescue customers $1 for every adoption that they execute through Paul. Analytics. 
Why we opted to go with that model is one, I personally have a background in animal rescue. I worked in, in foster base and animal sheltering for about 13 years before I decided to start politics. And part of that struggle of, of when I was running my own animal rescue organizations or was on teams of them was that we could not find any software programs that fit our price model where, you know, there is a, a lot of seasonality to animal adoptions. And so we don't know at any point in time when an animal is going to come through the door that needs, you know, very serious vet care. You know, we could get a call that a dog was hit by a car, needs an amputation, and all of a sudden we have to drop $4,000 on this dog coming into our care. Uh, and at the, on the other end of that, we don't know uh, the volatility of donations on the other side. And so to have a consistent typical SaaS model of, hey, pay 100 bucks a month just really doesn't entice or work with our current customer set, which is the foster-based animal rescues. And so in be, being able to price it out as, hey, this is a performance-based price model of $1 for every adoption. At the point of adoption, you know you have money coming in the door, and we're only going to take literally $1 of that. And so that price model has been utilized in the animal sheltering world in the past and, and in all of the research and from our personal experience and, and doing a lot of uh, qualitative interviews as well, we definitely came to the conclusion that $1 per adoption reduced the barrier for the number of organizations that we're going to be able to afford our product and, and, and gives them the flexibility, you know, for times like when a global pandemic hits and all of a sudden adoption shut down. But then on the other end of that, as things pick up and adoptions then spiked two months after the pandemic hit, that they were able to keep up and, and utilize the software at a very, you know, great price for them. Liz, so what's the journey been like so far? I think you got about three years in, right? So yeah. what's uh, what's the journey been like so far? And then maybe to start that question, how did you come up with the idea? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So I, I started the idea actually after founding a couple other companies that had failed miserably, but they were all within the animal welfare space. So my lifelong dream ever since I've been a little kid has been I want to make a ton of money and I want to save all the animals that I can on this earth. And so my lifelong journey was trying to smush those two concepts together. And so my first company was trying to open up a cat cafe here in Lincoln, Nebraska. The market was simply not ready for a cat cafe at that time. And so I pivoted and started looking into building technology companies. Uh, and I was a college student at the University of Nebraska. And from there, decided to start a company called Family Pet Project, which was a way for people to rehome pets online safely, uh, because what I was noticing in the industry was a lot of owners were getting turned away from foster-based animal rescues because they just simply didn't have the space. They were inundated. And so Family Pet Project launched. We had a product out there for about a year and a half. We had people rehoming pets through our website all over the nation. And we quickly realized this is not going to be sustainable. How can we continue to help animals and make a career, make a business out of it? So I started interviewing the animal shelters and animal rescues. And at this time, I'm also running my own and on, on the team of about four other animal rescues as well. And the feedback was like, hey, your family pet project software is great. Uh, it's clear you know how to make software, but we need something that's going to help us be more efficient internally, not just keep pets out of the shelter. And so at that point, uh, we, my, my teammates and I looked at each other and said, well, we've built software once already. We can do it again. So let's scrap this and, and restart, basically. And so that was back in about 2017. And we started, you know, performing more and more customer interviews on other animal shelters and animal rescues. The same problems came to the surface. And, and then that's when politics started. And again, it started as simply management software for animal rescues. And it wasn't until about a year to a year and a half after launching that we started to examine our own data and look at what our own company's larger picture could be that we realized that we had all these health records, microchip numbers, and that there was a much larger way that we could impact the, the animal health industry as a whole. That's awesome. Mm -hmm. um, so Liz, love the energy, love the dynamics. Yeah. Uh, you you know, nothing, nothing brings you to success like a couple of really good failures. So, <laughs> and it's, it's the same for me, same for Sean. If you don't go through a rough patch and don't get up and, and keep going, 
uh, there's no there's no success. So I, you know, I compliment you on that and how open you are about it, because, yeah. you know, not everybody can be like, OK, that was a flop and let's <laughs> move forward. So really, really cool. And they love the spirit. So I wish all the best to politics. We always ask two questions uh, at the end. One of them is their TED Talk book video or something that you could recommend to our listeners? Absolutely. So I would absolutely recommend reading Pet Nation by Mark Cushing. I've always known that pets have a very large impact on our nation and on, on our market as well. And after reading Pet Nation, uh, honestly, my mind was blown with how much pets have embedded their lives into our own in the U.S. and how that has affected you know, our, our nation's economy from the various jobs that pets have created to the the stories and the icons that have been created through animals as well. So I absolutely love Pet Nation. I mean, the first four chapters alone were giving me goosebumps by reading all the data and numbers behind how much we really love our pets and how that's shaped our nation. That's so awesome. Mark's a great guy. Last question, Liz, um, another innovator, somebody you think we should have on the show? Absolutely. A uh, powerhouse of a female. Her name is Carrie O'Hara, Dr. Carrie O'Hara. Uh, she runs APG O'Hara Research and Analytics, and she is one of the premier data uh, analytics and researchers in the pet care space. I think she's an absolute powerhouse. She has a very good understanding and comprehension of the consumer pet market and how that's shaping the animal health industry and she's got a lot of wisdom to share thank you so much for listening to the veterinary innovation podcast if you want to hear about our new episodes please follow us on any social media channel also you can check out our website at veterinaryinnovationpodcast.com see you next week